And uh, on this occasion, on behalf of our uh, Honorable Chancellor and the management, and on our Board of Management and our University at large, I have the uh, honor of uh, welcoming uh, my good friend, my colleague, you know, Dr. Ravi Jali, who has been my colleague for more than three decades. Uh, he's a well known diabetologist and uh, a very a great uh, administrator. You know, he has been uh, on set. I did not mean that. Yes. Yeah, I, I said that Dr. M. E. Jali is a the known diabetologist and a well known figure, not only in India, even abroad as well. And uh, he has a unique distinction of uh, heading the great esteemed organization, you know, the LA Hospital, Dr. Prabhakar Pure Hospital, which is having uh, 2,400 beds, more than that. And we are having 300 plus uh, critical care beds, uh, probably a unique uh, feature of any of the hospitals in this area, in this region rather. Uh, that's the mega that she has been managing for nearly two decades now. That's a wonderful thing. And in various fronts, some of the hospital, I let it be a kidney foundation, let it be a heart foundation, let it be a, any other uh, super specialty also. It is uh, doing a wonderful service, human service in the other part of Karnataka, which caters to uh, southern Maharashtra and the entire state of uh, Goa. And uh, Dr. M. E. Jari, the professor of uh, diabetology and general medicine at uh, Jawaharlal Nehru Metro College. And he's also in charge, the uh, director of the cancer hospital. He started a couple of years back. And he got his training in the premier institute uh, uh, in the uh, US, that is the Jocelyn Diabetic Center, Harvard University. And he is uh, he, the uh, president of the National Diabetic Foundation, Belgami, and he is the chairman of our oh. Institutional Ethics Committee of our university. He is a proud recipient of the BC Royal National Award. And he is also the bestower of the Dr. Sate Award for Diabetic Association of India. And he got uh, our prestigious uh, Government of Karnataka State Rajyotsava Award. And uh, he has been the principal investigator, study group, of the TB diabetes mellitus by direction study of WHO. Uh, this is in a nutshell. We have, I, and I know him as a good clinician with a great acumen and a good administrator and a good human being, you know. Uh, and he's holding the fort, but I said, for what there's such a big uh, structure with multiple uh, specialties, multiple foundations, and uh, he, he's got a tremendous explosion, tremendous. Uh, in addition to that, he is the baby that uh, diabetic center in the KLA hospital has its own activities, his own publications. They have a registry of the, uh, I don't know, I don't remember exactly the number of uh, enrolled uh, diabetic registrations with him and uh, regular publications. So, but, and, uh, and he has been a great organizer too, you know, the rural conferences. I went to, we used to organize together when I was in. Uh, Welcome. Such a wonderful, excellent personality is there to speak on his uh, front line or a first hand experience on the diabetes. We all know that uh, one or two thoughts on that. We are in India, or we can say that the diabetic capital of the world, only number two country next to China to have a maximum number of uh, uh, diabetic patients. You know, very, uh, nearing 80 million. You know, China is around 12 million, they said 120 million. Uh, and you know the forecast they say by 2025 it will be like this 2030 you know it is like this in spite of uh, Indian government mm -hmm. establishing the national program for control of uh, uh, cancer, diabetes, and uh, cardiac disease, so many things are in place. But diabetes is on the rise, especially the type two diabetes on the rise. Of course, there are some precipitating factors apart from genetic factors, even uh, the environmental. Uh, factors and the lifestyle changes, urbanization, all have contributed in their own way for this thing. And uh, uh, we also have been listening. I remember from my student days and maybe 40 years back, I was listening every time something new, either about the drug, either about the diagnosis, either about the gadget. Till this day, so many things are coming. That means just uh, everything new and new is being invented, means nothing, whatever is invented is far from. Being idea. This is what on some two weeks we can blank conclusions. 
you know, see, when you start exploring more and more and more, you no, know, because you do whatever you have now, you don't have a satisfaction, you don't have a full 100%. Uh, that's how I just like to look at that. And, you know, everything, uh, apart from that, a recent one, there's autoimmune diseases, the beta cells of the cells that are electroplant, they get destroyed. So many things are there. And I was telling him, you know, uh, he sent the abstract of uh, this, uh, uh, what is that? Mm. This a glycemic variety, variability, and another one is this uh, time in range. And I tried to read that, and I was requesting in the morning. You know, many of the students also will be participants. You just please uh, simplify and tell to the advantage of them as well. Is what I was telling. With these uh, few words, I once again welcome Dr. Mulikarjun Jali for this particular platform and all the interactive. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, Dr. over to you, Dr. Jali. I'll stop sharing and uh, you can uh, take over, right? Yeah. Uh, thank you, sir, for that nice introduction. We'd request Dr. Jali to take the stage. And before that, uh, a few requests to the participants. One is uh, please keep your audio muted so that uh, experience is good for everyone. And uh, second thing is uh, this program is being recorded and it is being transmitted live on YouTube so that uh, we can use it for academic purposes later on. Uh, with this few announcements, uh, we'll proceed to the session. Uh, over to you, Dr. Jalil. You can share yeah, the Thank you very much. Now. Thank you very much. With the chanting of poem, I start this uh, today's uh, program. I'm very much impressed with the Professor uh, of Kotur, Dean ABMC, and H, a very well known uh, academician, administrator. He was the head of the anesthesiology department of uh, our uh, hospital, later on, close to the staff position, then the vice chancellor position. He is a man of multifacet. And always I call him an innovative personality. Everywhere, wherever he goes, he puts his mark with innovative things. And I was very much glad to see a new venture of AVMC's FFF webinar series started that was giving a wonderful way of disseminating the knowledge for all the medical fraternity over India, especially for students, postgraduates, and postdoctoral people, and many others who can able to take up sitting in their home, at the comfort of their home, they can able to get uh, the benefits of learning process. So that he has initiated. I congratulate uh, uh, Dr. Professor uh, Koto. Meanwhile, I also thank Professor uh, Meena Laksh Mahalakshmi Vyan. She is the Dean of uh, HPE of uh, AVMC. And I also thank for her coordination, coordinating with me for initiating this today's topic. We have this topic, the glycemic variability. Share, I can share my, this one. Yes, sir, you can share. So this uh, glycemic variability, This is one of the important topic, glycemic variability in diabetes, especially the clinical application and therapeutic implication, what it can happen in our routine uh, way. Way back if I see during my student days, that we used to see the urine for sugar in uh, Benedict's test and see the condition of the patient. Depending on that, we used to give the insulin or the uh, treatment 
used to happen. The way we have progressed in the last four decades, it is immensible. I call it, it is an art. Art means, I say with an abbreviation, A stands for new approaches we started learning over the time. R stands for new researchers and new technologies that has made a wonderful way of handling the diabetic populations for, for especially in India, which is uh, supposed to be the, the world's largest population based with India. Sometimes I wonder whether are we a democratic country or are we a diabetic country? Unless we take a proper steps with this varieties of approaches, researches and technologies, we would not be heading forward further. So with this background, I just want to brief the student in case there are there. The glycemic variability, I would be abbreviating as a GB. It means a swinging in blood glucose levels. The diminished or absent glycemic autoregulation or shortfalls of insulin availability at that time is hypothesized to be the etiological factor for these glycemic bumps. Bumps means ups and downs. Of course, intermittent high blood glucose exposure rather than constant high blood glucose exposure to the cell or the tissue has been showing to have a deleterious effect in experimental studies. Physicians utilize quantitatively and qualitatively the values of glycemic parameters such as fasting, protein we use, fasting blood sugar, postprandial blood sugar, and uh, further, we also use glycated hemoglobin, that is HbA1c. Previously used to as uh, we used to use GHB. Now we are advanced with the glycated hemoglobin with uh, high pressure lipid chromatography. In uh, regular day-to-day -day practice, in the present era of uh, ranging optimum glycemic control, it is also essential to focus on glycemic variability as an additional goal point along with the traditional followed parameters. The presentation of mine today, it reveals the clinical perspectiveness and understanding its role in the contribution of glycemic control in diabetic patients and how we can able to make a good living for them. I have nothing to declare about it in uh, conflict of interest. So we know that the diabetes uh, global emergency in 2015 is an old one, keeps on changing. The people with diabetes in India, Bangladesh, Nepal, and Sri Lanka make up a large number of population, almost nearing 99% of the Southeast Asian population of total adult with diabetes. And one side we have uh, the, the population based on uh, this one. Uh, India has been a contribution for the uh, regional mortality with more than 1 million deaths happening uh, due to uh, diabetes itself. It is one of the major cause for death due to diabetes after the cancer and all other things. And now we have another thing is that it doesn't differentiate between urban and rural population, though the impact on urban is little higher. But now urban and rural population are getting mixed up. I call that rural because the rural population is coming near to the urban area. They get the same benefits of lifestyle and they also mimic the lifestyle changes. So that makes uh, the difference of uh, the population. Yeah, thank you. So right now we have uh, almost uh, two types of uh, Right now we have a pandemic. One is the India he is merging with the, right now the COVID pandemic. Another one is that uh, non-communicable disease that is the 
the COVID, which is uh, ham uh, hampering the whole world itself, and uh, communicable diseases and the non communicable diseases, there is a big uh, game is going on in the whole world. So, just to highlight the semi urban nature of the study population of Kudremo, I was working in Kudremo uh, town. It is an industrial town. We made it was just after my graduation. I just did an epidemiological study. That was the paper was, was not accepted in India, but accepted for, by the BMJ. Assuming that the, the uh, what I represented at that time was prevalence rate of 5%. The study was with Ramachandra. Vishnathan and Dr. Mohan and Sne Snehalata. The, in 1985, the prevalence was almost 5% and rose to almost uh, the right now a 20 to 24% in many parts of the country. So this Kudremuk study has become a, one of the important uh, reference points for the epidemiological studies for all the uh, uh, people who are working in the field of epidemiology. So coming to today's uh, learning objectives for the audience here, I would like to give some objective guidelines on how the understanding of glycemic variability, what it makes if it goes up, that is a hyperglycemia, or it downs and its clinical significance, what it is the impact on our diabetic patients. The second one will outline the role of Indian diet especially the Indian phenotyping system is entirely different. So different types of glycemic variability goes with the system of our dietary system, Indian diet system. And another part is challenges in glycemic variability about the assessment and ways to how we can able to minimize it and take the advantage of it for making a good practice for giving a good healthy lifestyle, healthy uh, living for diabetic population. The last one is to understand overall management strategy of glycemic variability with our new approaches, new researches, and new technologies. And this is the first polling questions that I have for the participants who would like to take which factors in your patients affect the glycemic variability. You can select multiple question options in this. The first one is A, meal pattern and variability. B is lifestyle and compliance. C is metabolic variability. D, body mass index. E, GFR between 30 to 45 ml per minute. F, duration of type 2 diabetes mellitus. Last one, G, visit to visit fasting plasma glucose variability. You have 10 seconds, and if somebody is monitoring this one, please. Yeah, we'd request the participants to put their responses in the chat box. I'm sure most of them must be doing well. The answer is A, ah. B. We have received C. answer A, B, D, F. Yeah, quite fine. But it would be more appropriate A, B, C, F, G. Let's go further. We will understand a bit about it. So it is just, it was just a matter of getting ourselves tuned up for this today's uh, presentation. This overview will give the glycated hemoglobin A1C levels have traditionally been the gold standard for assessing glycemic control and treatment efficacy in patients with type 2 diabetes. We call this HbA1C as integrated control to see the integrated control of diabetes. However, A1C does not take into account of fluctuation in blood glucose levels known as glycemic variability. It only records the previous three to say about eight to 12 weeks and so, but it doesn't take the blood glucose fluctuations 
as glycemic variability. This is a very important thing which we have to understand. In the recent years, GB has become increasingly clinically relevant in our practice because of a better understanding of the need to reach target A1C. They are all equally parallelly complementing each other while avoiding hypoglycemia. The cardiovascular, the, the, sorry, the GV relates to both hyperglycemia and hypoglycemia together and has been associated with poorer quality of life. So we would be discussing on triad and tetrad variability and the importance of glycemic variability, time and range, that is also has come up recently. And the GV and complications treatment to address how to address this, both the factors GV, which coincides with the TIR time in range, and the summary. This glucose triad, if you look at this, we used to focus on the fasting blood sugars and the postprandial glucose and HbA1c as a triad. This is an evidence that the earlier concept of glucose triad is insufficient at the moment to reflect a true glycemic variability. With this background, we moved on to glycemic variability. So the glycemic tetrad moved towards glycemic fluctuation, that is variability, as well as HbA1c implicated in the onset and progression of diabetic complications. It is must, it is a necessity to evaluate glycemic control in terms of both HbA1c and glycemic variability. This is the present situation that one has to go about it. And now we are coming to glycemic, after that we are coming to glycemic triad versus glycemic pentad. How from three things, the fasting blood sugar, postprandial, and HbA1c, we moved on to understand a bit more with new approaches that here it added the, the quality of life importance. Whenever you are controlling diabetes or regulating the diabetic patients, he must feel that he is as good as normal with anyone else in the society. So this was made as an a glycemic pentad. Five things happened. The glycemic triad, then two, it went for pentad to the exard. From triad to exard. What is this exard? The sixth one came into the picture. The glycemic triad was HP1C, FPZ, and postprandial went to the, the sixer. That is the triad to exard sixer the glycemic variance, an important parameter of diabetes management. The reason is that because the Indian diet and glycemic variability due to regional, cultural, ethical, and also the geographical locations, the Indians, they live in different parts of the Indian subcontinent. Background influences the dietary pattern in India. If you look at the the South Indian population, they have their own food pattern system. Looking into the North Indian, East India, Eastern part of India, and the Western part of India. So that makes a difference in increasing the high carbon diets, that is with their dietary saturated fats, that constitutes almost 60 to 70% in Indian diet. If you look at the fat portion of it, there is almost 15 to 20%, and protein is quite less. So Indian meal composition constitutes that wherein Shashank Joshi, he published his one of his uh, well-known paper in 2016, that still holds good even now. And Dr. Mohan Vishwanathan and uh, Dr. Ramachandran, the Vijay and all that uh, have been working on most of these uh, systems about uh, dietary, how Indian phenotypic uh, is uh, uh, enforced with the dietary system also. Now we are coming to diabetes, types of glycemic variability according to various time frames. Let's look at the types of glycemic variability according to various time frames. As we look at it, the types of GB, there is a short term, intermediate, long term. 
The short term is between 24 to 72 hours. The intermediate is up to one month, especially day to day variations. And the last one is a longer duration, seasonal variation more than 10 years. If you look at the long term variation, there is based on visit to visit. Glycemic variation is there. Several studies have concretely proved, reported that long standing glycemic variation variability will is been related to microangiopathy, maybe a small vessel disease or a large vessel disease. That is the micro and macro angiopathies in patients with type 2 diabetes. It also very much increased in especially the population, elderly population in India. You know that in India, almost 10 to 12 percent Indian population are elderly, over 65 and above. Or the next, as the health system develops, probably elderly population would increase. The prevalence rate in them also would be increasing. It is our responsibility to give them good clinical benefits to give them a healthy lifestyle and a healthy diabetes health, this one. So going to the next, uh, this one, addressing the glycemic variation. What is this it means? The glycemic variability within the normal range is inherent to physiological glucose metabolism. Both hyperglycemic, that is the high glucose and low glucose variability contributes to morbidity and mortality, both. Acute glucose fluctuations from one end to another, from hyper to hypo, hypo to hyper, are associated with oxidative stress, the free radicals that may contribute to complications, diabetic complications, may be micro or macro. The treatment should be individualized for each person for their BMI, for their age, their pattern, foot pattern, their background, their uh, family history, the glucose control targets must be individualized so that to avoid the frequent hypoglycemic events. So this should be the aim of this, the, uh, the treatment. So variation is a rule. It is not just a mistake, it is a rule. Each individual has got his own uh, variations. It is not limited to only the postprandial glucose excursion. It is also overall HbA1c also can be fixed, but the glycemic variability can change. Such fluctuation is particularly marked in type 1 diabetes and to a lesser extent in type 2 treated with insulin or with OHA, hypoglycemic agents. So the non-insulin dependent patients also explain, also experience such peak and tough that I call them peak and valley also in sort of trough patterns with acute glucose variations. The peaks are usually corresponding to maximum values after meals, especially in Indian meals. They, when we say the breakfast, they literally eat the meal. They, I keep stressing them, break the fast. Overnight you have been fasting. So you just in the morning, it should be, you should break the fast. That is the nomenclature given by our erstwhile rulers, British people, breakfast. Anyway, the non-insulin dependent patient can also experience such peak and trough, troughs patients with acute glucose variations when they consume a heavy meal. Hey, look at this, HP events in glycemic variability. One is to measure the mean glycemia of the past three to four months. It is called an integrated control of A1C or integrated control of diabetes, what we are doing regularly, which reflects the risk for type 2 diabetes complication. Way back a decade ago, there used to be a constant uh, presentation in many of the conferences. If you reduce 1% of HB A1C, you would be reducing the complications of diabetes by similar some percentages. That was the classical way of presentation. The different glucose profiles can result in similar A1C level. If you look at it, A1C is 7.5. The plasma glucose here, the measurement mean glycemia, what I told that, the different glucose profile can result in similar A1C values, but the fasting plasma glucose our postprandial plasma glucose measures allow for daily glucose 
there will be variations but they still maintain 7.5 this variation is the most vulnerable portion for the preventing the diabetes complication this is one of the oldest hypothesis it returns after almost more than nearing 15 years a forgotten hypothesis i call it a metabolic memory whenever a glucose molecule enters the body at whether it's a peak or valley or trough it puts its print imprint in the genetic that is in the mitochondria so chronic hyperglycemic can put a oxidative distress free radicals are released that advance glycated the end products in turn they make a vicious cycle with the chronic inflammation inflammatory markers then epigenetic uh, changes which are also contributes for increasing the inflammation and ag productions the epigenetic means the environmental factors in turn it is in a cascading system with each other oxidative stress to ag to chronic inflammation to epigenetic back to ag and that makes the vascular complications setting up and that is remembered as a metabolic memory in the mitochondria in a simpler words when a diagnosis is made when a diagnosis is made so that uh, at the this one the hyperglycemia over the time of 5 years the microvascular endpoints begin microvascular the gets damaged then the perivascular fibrosis over the next five to the next uh, onwards of a decade or so the macrovascular changes also starts beginning with this we can able to understand that how these complication can set in in a metabolic memory so that has come back and that will be a now it would be integrated with glycemic variability this glycemic variability refers to the fluctuation in blood glucose both peaks and troughs glycemic variability is an integral component of glucose hemostasis although it has not yet been definitively confirmed as an independent risk factor for diabetes complications but the glycemic variability can represent the presence of excess glycemic excursions and consequently the risk of hypoglycemia as peak or hypoglycemia as trough valleys in this slide it is focused on the recent evidence examining the association between glycemic variability and diabetes related clinical complications as well as strategies currently available to address the challenging aspects of diabetes management so this is a pooled analysis of six rc studies what are the six rc studies so one that uh, random randomized controlled studies the glycemic variability that intraday changes and again intraday that puts stress on the hyperglycemia hypoglycemia poor quality of life and mortality with all that one can see that the effect of gv on patients will be reduction in gv corresponds to psychological well being and improved if at all if it improves there will be good quality of life how to measure glycemic variability most important are two things measure that measures the glycemic variability one is amplitude of glucose excursion how high it goes how much time it takes how much amplitude it peaks up suddenly is it the mean amplitude of glucose excursion is very fast suppose we take a glass of sugar juice the mean amplitude of glucose excursion is very fast as compared to millet based some liquid juice or something like that so this is the standard deviation and the coefficient of variance these are the three items which are required for the amplitude of glucose excursion measurement similarly the time spent outside the target range we have a target range 
in the glycemic variability that is time in range how much of time he had this excursion that is a high excursion or a low excursion that is the time in range that is the bandwidth we'll speak about this bandwidth a little bit later on and the gmi that's glucose management indicator that's also one part that also gives the time spent outside the target range that will help to measure the glycemic variability now coming to the high glycemic variability is how it is associated with diabetes related complications and poor quality of life if you look at this the glycemic variability has also been shown to be associated with markers of endothelial and cardiovascular damage even in patients with diabetes of short duration accompanied by optimal glycemic control even if he's been controlled in patients with type 2 diabetes and acute myocardial infarction say the glycemic variability if it is too much it has been shown to predict mortality observed in patients with increased visit to visit glycemic variability so in a inpatient one has to keep this glycemic variability bear in into the time in range ratio only the cardiovascular risk factors in type 2 diabetes have been shown to be directly related to postprandial glucose levels this is a very alarming state in indian population genetically how they have been linked to this one is still a, a illusion or still to be elucidated and coming to this one in people with type 2 diabetic high glycemic variability has been associated with also cognitive impairment whether it is a hypo or uh, too severe hyperglycemia especially in elderly population this not only myocardial infarction the increased risk of mortality it is observed also cognitive defects or memory lapses so now coming as i told you that the many phases of a 7% a1c though it might be they are in 7% range the physician feels very happy about it but therefore it is important to look at the amplitude and how much of time that he to achieve the same 7% in different people say on three people will be 7% but that glucose excursion mean amplitudes will be different so this the graph the right side of the graph shows that in three different individuals with same hp a1c value of 7% there were differences in the duration of time in range these individuals achieved though they achieved hp a1c of same but the peak and trough were different in these three individuals therefore it is important to minimize the glycemic variability which will lead to better time in range values for people with diabetes mellitus so therefore it is important to minimize the variability so again see the time one is the horizontal another one is the amplitude how fast it peaks up with a different glycemic load and a different glycemic index based diet so let's see that glucose fluctuation are a process in time that has two dimension one is the amplitude how fast it goes and that will be implicated in mitochondrial as a memory metabolic memory and the time it has enjoyed there the glucose molecule or molecules so it is the amplitude and time is important the projected along its amplitude and this process is measured by metrics measurements such as the s dor maze that is called shutter's division of responsibility you might be little bit confused about this the s dor maze that is in a nomenclature used setters is an author he made it division of responsibility in feeding in the context of restrictive snack management practice especially in children whatever they ask nowadays we provide them what they like it we do not 
select the menu for them. They select the menu for that. So there is a criteria called SDAR maze system. So projected along its time axis, this process is assessed by temporal characteristics such as time within target range and time spent in IPO or hyperglycemia. It may be both a side. How much of time has been spent in hypo or hyper? So we should know the amplitude and the time is a important part of time of glucose excursion in learning the glycemic variability. So look at this time for a change. We have Helms Elmsay Charitable Trust. They were the first people, the expert panel. They initiated this target range was defined by them. The practical application of continuous glucose monitoring was initiated in metrics in clinical practice has been as way back in 2000, but in 2012, the Helmsley, they started a little bit more forcibly. Their initiative of sponsoring the first expert panel with an objective to recommend the standardization of continuous glucose monitoring, CGM, matrix measurement, and CGM report visualization, actually how to interpret it. Though a series of CGM consensus statements refining the core CGM metrics were put forth, no conclusions were met. It was just ignored till 2017. Some awareness came somewhere in 2019 wherein ATDD, the Technology Department, and the American Diabetic Association, they just brought it that it is in a very important aspect of the TIR. Then came somewhere in uh, the American uh, Diabetic Association advocates now the use of CGM in its 2020, the standard of medical care in diabetes, it has come in the recent guidelines booklet. It says that, when used properly, real time and intermittently scanned continuous glucose monitors in conjunction with insulin therapy are useful tools to lower the HbA1c and or reduce even the hypoglycemic in adults with type 2 diabetes who are not meeting glycemic targets. The guidelines included recommendation for real time and intermittently scanned CGMS. That is the last one, the 2020, wherein it was being advocated by the ADA, American Diabetic Association. Before that, even it has been uh, certified by the American Association of Clinical Endocrinology, American College of uh, Endocrinology. So now, TIR. And what about below, you will see in range, people with diabetes should spend at least 70, what was it, what was it? Can you see? Yes, sir. Yes. We can see, sir. Okay. Time in range uh, and okay. what is above and below in range. Yeah, there is something was went wrong here. Okay. So if this is the time in range. At least every individual with diabetes, 70% of their time in range in a day. That is, the range is 70% to 180 milligram percent. They must spend at least 70% of their time in TIR, time in range. What is the time in range? The range is 70 milligrams to 180 milligram. And they must, each patient, if he spends 70 percent of it, it is a healthy that has been shown in the green band. If it is shown in the minimized, that is the above target, that is above, if the patient is 181 to 250, they are called level 1 hyperglycemic time in range people. If it goes beyond level 2 hyperglycemia, similarly people who spend less below target glucose range, they are called, they will be in hypoglycemia 54 to 
69, there is level 1 hypoglycemia and level 2 hypoglycemia. So let's see that TIR exhibits an inverse linear relationship with HbA1c. Higher the TIR, lower the A1c. Lower the TIR, higher the HbA1c. So TIR exhibits an inverse linear relationship with HbA1c. That is higher the TIR and lower the A1c as I said. So look at this graph, which role of both the classical parameter of glucose control, acute uh, fluctuation in development of complications. So one is the fasting uh, blood sugar. One is the fasting blood sugar, uh, which rises to the risk of complications. The other one is the HbA1c risk of complications sets in the activation of the oxidative stress, the fluctuation, mean amplitude glucose excursion, as I told, the amplitude which it uh, speaks very fast, rises very fast, the activation of the oxidative stress, all in all, one in together, they make a players in bringing the oxidative stress and glucose fluctuation, which all combine to produce complications. The association of uh, the GV and with the mortality. Looking at the glucose, looking at the this one, the glycemic variability, increased endothelial and CV damage. In patients with diabetes, with acute myocardial infarction, AMI, increased mortality can happen. The cardiovascular risk is related to higher postprandial glucose that is very well documented. So in the Indian population, postprandial blood sugar is the most important thing in our uh, uh, patients group. All-cause mortality, which you look at this all-cause mortality as compared to CV complications, the evidence from devote trial doubled day-to-day -day fasting gluco, uh, glycemic variability correlated to increased risk of severe hypoglycemia and all-cause mortality. So with this, now let us move to that uh, what are the large vessels or the macrovascular complications. They are the cardiovascular disease, coronary artery disease, myocardial artery disease, then cerebrovascular disease, peripheral vascular disease. These are some of the important things. Now, looking at uh, the glycemic variability and CV outcomes, I explained already the acute glucose fluctuations are associated with hypoglycemia and are emerging risk factors for cardiovascular outcomes. So especially in the uh, intensive care units, one has to keep a very close gly glycemic variability, not to have uh, peaks and uh, valleys. So with this, one can say that that if the glycemic variability is kept in a predictive level, the improvement chances are much better avoiding the acute coronary syndromes in uh, especially with the comorbid condition like diabetes in uh, critical care units. So coming to if we do not maintain or if we maintain time in range, what are the consequences of it? One is a microalbuminuria which everyone knows about it. That is the earliest indicator for going for kidney impairment or renal impairment. The person who stays 70% of is this one will have a minimal frequency of microalbuminuria or may not, he may escape from that. Whereas the person who stays for a long time in a TIR in an upper range, he will be facing in a more in a better, uh, I mean, in a complicated situation of getting microalbuminuria very early. Similarly, the retinopathy also plays the frequency of retinopathy is reduced 
with increased percent if time in range is well adapted maybe less than 5% is going to be happen that is a biggest advantage though the hvmc could be 7% but in the background if the variability that is the the variability is uh, too fluctuating then you will not achieve the goal what we want what are the outcomes if tir is not maintained i just told that uh, the retinopathy risk factor will increase by 64% and uh, the nephropathy risk factor goes by 40% and neuropathy risk factor goes by 25 in spite if the patient doesn't keep up if he keeps up in tir lesser than 5 10% he will be getting of this benefits the outcomes will be of this benefit. now if he doesn't maintain it these are the other side of the story of the thing so initial evidence also shows increase in the surrogate markers of macrovascular complications like abnormal carotid intimal thickness that is one of the things for stroke and other vascular diseases so now coming to the recent trend of covid 19 many deaths have happened many things have postulated by many authors this is the most recent to the april 2021 diabetes care the conclusion is that the threshold of glycemia and the outcome of covid 19 patients complicated with the diabetes if they have got in comorbid conditions other than diabetes with uh, other complication diabetes itself or other ailments the complications will be much higher the patients with diabetes and covid 19 have an increased risk of adverse outcomes with glucose levels if it is more than 160 and if it is less than 70 so they are out of the tir range and a high cv cardiovascular so therapies that must improve these metrics measurements of glycemic control will definitely result in better prognosis for these patients apart from their specific treatment for covid care so looking at this how we can able to reduce the uh, the sequences of covid either in the covid uh, outcome or in any other uh, comorbid conditions or uh, improvement of the complications in diabetes one is to reduce the one is to reduce the reduce the tir important l seldom measured it is very very seldomly measured in many of the uh, hospital practices especially those who call specialty they do not when the patient is not doing well it is better when the patient is sub optimally uh, maintaining his blood sugar or not satisfactorily one should use this uh, continuous glucose monitoring system to know or to see that uh, time in range is it in order despite its demonstrated value tir is seldom used in our practice so i stress once again that the importance of the addressing the glycemic variability and time in range where they stay is most important so are these are some of the things which i need not have to tell about it these are all uh, version of uh, continuous glucose monitoring system with sensors and can give a ready made on the mobile phones or on the uh, newer gadgets a laptop or ipad whatever the thing one can know that where there the patient himself can assess how he can able to modulate his uh, diet system especially indians they are more prone for doing fasting and the feasting after the fasting they go for feasting or the feast and then the fast so these are very important thing for this uh, set of population so this is a, a very old Uh, very most favorite uh, i mean uh, uh, side of mine so this is the centenary celebration of insulin discovery so if you look at the story of the last uh, 40 50 years you can see that uh, the lente insulin was in the beginning of 1960 grown up to nph then we came out with uh, you know monitoring system diagnosing from the urine sugar to we went to capillary glucose monitoring system and then we went to sorry continuous monitoring system with ccms similarly the insulin pumps came a uh, road insulin pumps came then advanced 
and uh, now we have gotten a highly sophisticated uh, the pumps have come lispro aspar glargine ditmud inhaled insulin and when to cell replacement beta cell replacement transplant program and this way we also we went with an sensitizers glenitides amylin glp1 gliptins so many varieties and now we have added sgl2 in the last 5 to 7 years so with this type of new approaches and new technologies and new researchers we have come with a prevention the prevention primary prevention secondary prevention and tertiary prevention they are most important i would recommend for primary prevention with having a good glycemic variability assessment and keeping the patient in time in range and in combination with other available diagnostic pentard or tetrad like uh, passing blood sugar postprandial and hba1c and ancillary supporting uh, diagnostic investigative uh, parameters when we are putting a lot of uh, medications poly medications so in conclusion the glycemic variability can be a future target parameter for optimal glycemic control over and above standard glycemic parameters like blood glucose and glycated hemoglobin this applies to all t1 uh, uh, type 1 diabetes and also type 2 diabetes gestational diabetes and probably even the non diabetic critically ill patients who are in the critical care unit many of the studies have shown improved outcomes for micro and to some extent macrovascular diabetic complications by minimizing the glycemic variability despite various formulas we offer a standard and straightforward clinical tool to define this glycemic variability is yet to evolve how we have been evolving now probably after 2 3 years later on probably this uh, glycemic uh, uh, variability may advance in a much better suited so that it will be handy for all the patients despite various formulas as i told that we need to have a current diabetes medicines like incretin mimetics newer basal and prandial insulin continuous subcutaneous insulin infusion system through the pumps and modern bariatric surgical techniques do not we do not know the long term complications of this but in obese type 2 this bariatric surgical techniques may help in type 2 diabetic patients significantly to reduce the glycemic variability in last summary the glycemic variability and time in range is a very important measurement of the quality of our glycemic control and give a, a satisfactory measure uh, measure of uh, feeling both for the physician for the caregiver and caretaker the evidence is to emerge with linking this increased glycemic variability and also tar within the bracket which i mentioned will increase the risk will definitely long term diabetes complication will be the increase will be reduced however gv and tr when it is associated with increased risk of severe hypoglycemia the diabetic complications and reduced quality of life will ensue so especially in elderly population as india is aging with more than 12% of the population and most of the in even in new delhi more than 85% of uh, elderly population living alone they have got their own psychological trauma being a geriatric society of india president i know the grievances of them as gv and tir are important at seldom measured but we have to make it a practice to our uh, those participant it is recommended to go for treatment solutions which take care of gv and tir not just the triad of uh, fbs and postprandial hbc even though not regularly monitored so with this the last one i thank you the glucodynamics of indian patients are very important for us because we don't want to rise up to rank 1 after the china so we want to make diabetes care capital india should become a diabetes care capital with this background improving glucodynamics of indian patients through our new approaches through our new researches new technologies and new education system like that what you people are giving to everyone that would definitely make we will be 
capable of uh, proceeding forwarding in healthcare system, at least in diabetes, in uh, specialty and uh, its allied uh, comorbid areas. Thank you very much for my, uh, whatever the patients listening. Thank you very much. If there are any questions, I would be glad to take. Uh, thank you, Dr. Jali. It was very interesting and engaging lecture. And I think uh, many of the participants found it very useful. I have some questions in the chat box, which which I would like to take uh, with your permission. The first question is from Dr. Joseph Philip Raj. He is a urologist. Sir has asked this question. Does the number and the extent of hyper and hypoglycemic uh, episodes predispose to the diabetic uh, nephropathy? And there is another question also. Can glycemic variability pented be used as a surrogate? Yeah, I will take one question at a time. That the first question he was asking number and about extent of hypo and hyperglycemic episodes as a precursor for diabetic nephropathy. See the uh, the question is that the management of hyperglycemia is in the hands of the patients. We give the treatment to diabetic patients. The consequences of that, the diabetic education is the most important part of it. We have a separate division called uh, nurse educators, uh, diabetes nurse educators. They give them all the care, how to take the injection, how to take the medication. But there is a definitely void of a larger number of uh, this one if they are not given education. So with this, either they may go into extreme hyperglycemia or they may go into sometimes hypoglycemia for not having a properly guided, educated uh, uh, diabetes uh, uh, treatment protocol. They may have inversely, uh, indirectly, they can go for urological uh, problems like impotency if it's uncontrolled or anything. In the nephrological side, they go for renal impairments. Uh, thank you, sir. There is one more question. Is microangiopathy reversible if you have a good glycemic control and you ensure that uh, the glycemic control is good? Yeah, this is a long-term study which I did in 1986 as my thesis, microvascular changes in diabetes, microangiopathy. So once this cascade system, as I told, this metabolic memory, the Peaks and valleys have set in for a long duration. I told about five years, five to down the line, five to 20 years. If they have been in that bracket period, so already the basement membrane thickening happens in the capillaries. This basement membrane thickening happens and it is a fixed uh, process. And uh, only we can able to, as uh, giving a good glycemic control with a good TAR in range and glycemic varia. I mean, uh, uh, what we just mentioned about uh, the variability. If you keep it up, we may able to keep the reduction process, not which is damaged, may not be able to eat. But to certain extent, we may able to give a a positive thing for this microangiopathic changes. But there are a lot of uh, studies. Advanced study is a positive study, but uh, the other ACCORD study and other studies haven't uh, given that much. But the DCC trial uh, very conclusively gave that they could able to reduce the complications of uh, microvascular changes in type 1 diabetes. It was one of the longest uh, study done, prospective study done. So that can be able to be applied. Thank you, sir. I think uh, taking from that only, this is the question from <clears throat> Dr. Vishnu Bhatt, our director of medical research. This uh, microangiopathy changes we are talking about, are they associated more with the duration of diabetes or with the glycemic control or both? See, both are complementing each other. One is the duration and one is the uncontrolled diabetes status. The duration, as the duration of diabetes increases, if the control is well within the bracket of what we discussed today, probably we may have the microangiopathic changes or the microvascular large vessel disease, uh, small vessel disease can be able to be um, curtailed. I have seen in my own patients when we give a very good glycemic uh, profile, 
of the patients, though they are in the verge of going into a, you know, impaired renal functions, that is their first microalbuminuria has reduced. That is the one uh, positive sign. But however, the, if the duration is prolonged and the glycemic profile is not appropriate, probably they will not be in a beneficiary of, uh, you know, reversal of the diabetes. Because here many factors do take care. Not only that, uh, you know, giving a duration of the, this one treatment protocol, but their lifestyle will, uh, system has to be also to be endorsed. It is not just the treatment from the uh, caregiver. It is also from the patient who had to take the uh, things in hand. It is a both side uh, cooperation. <clears throat> uh, there is uh, one more uh, question. Will using an insulin pump be the solution to control this uh, sugar levels at, uh, yeah, for uh, better glycemic control? That's also from Dr. Vishnu. Uh, some of the patients are, I call them dis uh, diabetes in distress. When I see one time they will be having a glycated hemoglobin and variability will be fairly well. Now when I'm seeing post COVID or the still, you know, the first post COVID, I'm seeing the patient either very well controlled. I am amazed who was uncontrolled in the past and some who are controlled well, they have gone to the extreme, the other end of it. So these people, we cannot just put them on an insulin pump because it needs a lot of education. We need to have a pump educators who had to continuously monitor them. Definitely that, uh, you know, those uh, patients who are not in proper bandwidth, especially distressed diabetes, I call them, uh, uh, swinging from one end to another, they are the suitable candidates, number one. Number two is that we had to intensively monitor these people who are insulin pumps. Continuous subcutaneous insulin infusion, we have to give a, a very close uh, monitoring system, either by telephonic, day to day, or in the beginning, we must have a good uh, pump instructor. Insulin pump instructors are very much. And there are designs are changing so rapidly that, you know, especially kids, those who are using, especially we give for type 1 diabetics, who are to be given, you know, long-term uh, lifespan. So we advocate in more of in uh, type one. Of course, we have given also in type two, but it gives a good control provided they manage it well in advice of the pump instructor and uh, advice of the physicians. It can give a good control, but the cost effectiveness is quite high. That we have to look into the economics of uh, Indian economics. That was the reason I was telling about the last Indian map showing the glucodynamics. It has to control the economics. It has to control the uh, glyc um, the glucose uh, uh, control system and also our treatment protocol. So this is called the the last uh, is the dynamics. Glucodynamics is a very important. So economics, if it can able to take up the in patients who are not well controlled, we can definitely advise insulin pumps. But of course, now we have got a novel therapies have come. Shortly, maybe a one shot a week may come soon. That is, we are working on that. That some of the semaglutide, liraglutide combination, so much of armamentarium we have. That's what I was telling. Advances, researches, and techniques. The technologies. As he mentioned, that uh, pump is one of the well-known technology. We, who knows? We may have much more better technologies in years to come. Thank you, sir. I think you have answered uh, Dr. Kalsa, your old friend, his question about the economics of uh, glucose variab glycemic variability. Uh, there are no further questions in the chat box. I'd uh, request our dean uh, if you have any comments or reviews or questions, sir, please unmute yourself. Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Malikarjun. It was uh, quite interesting. Many newer things. I will stick on to two questions. Uh, probably I must have retracted with you when uh, I used to meet you. Any update yep. on that? A patient yep. on, patients on patients on oro hypoglycemic agent stabilized well. Mm -hmm. Between taking for a month or two, 
is uh, crystalline insulin or uh, whatever it is, with the intention that you know these like beta cells of islet of Langerhans will get some rest and get rejuvenated. So you will have a thereafter better control. Is it thinking proven now? So the one the is Professor Kotur. It is a very logically very interesting question, which uh, it came almost two decades back when I was in Jocelyn. I was just thinking that beta cell rest concept. Suppose when a person comes with an acute florid over to diabetes, and we start early insulinization, early insulin therapy. So the six cell, the quantum of beta cells in the pancreas, I used to call them, uh, excuse me for the word I'm going to use, just like uh, uh, menopause, andropause, I call pan uh, pancreopause. So when the pancreopause is setting in, the beta cell starts also decreasing in their capability of producing the insulin. At that time, if the patient comes with uh, some over symptoms of diabetes, if we give insulin, probably the six cells, the cells which are not uh, uh, properly functioning, can get rejuvenated. Okay, that is one part of it in only type 2 diabetes. We also see the type 2 diabetes over a period of decades going into a like a pattern of type 1 diabetes in an elderly. Even I've seen type 1 pattern in ninth decade also. The degradation beta cell goes very slow. In your case, you mentioned that after having achieved a euglycemic profile, he would like to give a short course of short doses of uh, short acting insulins to see that your beta cells are fairly well. Okay, why should we give B? I mean, it is a logically, if you can able to do C peptide levels and see that if your C peptide levels are intact, it means that it says that your pancreas is healthy. There is no need to pump some more to strengthen them. There is no need to give them exercise. So the C peptide level is a hallmark. It gives a quantity quantification of your pancreatic beta cell health or pancreatic health. So that should be able to suffice at the moment. And also you can do some immune markers. Are there? Are you are heading for uh, some sort of uh, uh, LADA, you know, latent onset type of diabetes, autoimmune uh, diabetes in uh, adult life. Like that, you can have some markers if you are little apprehensive about uh, your beta cells. So I think that uh, instead of taking uh, unnecessarily and, uh, you know, sometimes, you know, erotically, you may go into hypoarte when you are sitting in a, you know, meeting or something like that, the short actings are, you know, the predictability of for different brands are different, especially the human, uh, this one compared to analog, the predictability of insulin is quite variable. So when you are by a few days, you must have been comfortable. The day when you are sitting in a very important, uh, you know, um, agenda, you suddenly you should not feel, you know, um, uh, what you call that, uh, the attended uh, level of uh, cognition. Hello. So I feel that C peptide level should give you a fair idea for your uh, healthy pancreas. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Malika. Did I answer your question or insulin. did I deviate? <laughs> you should be able to tell me whether you have answered my question or not. I'm a layman. No, you used to ask me about always that should we take uh, a short acting after having controlled. I don't think it is necessary. You can do a lifestyle management and you do it regularly. I know that you are the only person <laughs> I have seen seriously morning uh, rushing out <laughs> for a walk for all this too. I should and congratulate. And I, 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 I want to tell all the participant, Dr. Uh, Professor Fotu, when he was here with <laughs> us, he won the race at the, uh, you know, when all youngsters <laughs> less than 40 years, they fail to compete with him in running. So that shows his <laughs> exercise profile. Uh, yeah, my, my, uh, thank you, Professor Milika. Second question is, you know, we, we have been, we have been having our uh, diabetic center for almost now nearing four, three, four, more than four decades now in uh, KLE. We, we completed two decades and, from the past. Uh, yeah. Uh, 
we have uh, this the uh, one yoga section over there, you know, which has been conducting regular activities over there. Do you have any substantial evidence that indulging in these things will have a definite uh, effect on the glycemic control? Which one? Which center? Meditation. Uh, center. Yoga. Effect of yoga. Yeah. The yoga definitely in people who are stressed out, they are, uh, you know, we have measured their uh, cortisol levels also. There are some stress, this one. Their cortisol levels are quite high. When we give them yoga, especially the pranayama and uh, this one, uh, this one, anuloma, viloma, and um, guided meditation, they are come out with you know reduction in their glycemic profile. One of our paper was published on yoga in type 2 diabetic patients. So I am very much convinced. And also the last time art of living with the diabetes at the KRSDI in Tumkur, uh, my main item was on yoga, meditation, and including laughter. How they are reducing the 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 glucose level to a certain level that is not you know fine we can able to fine tune them if they are in a border level probably they don't need any intervention by the uh, caregivers of diabetes so that is more than enough lifestyle modification behavioral changes and diet sattvic ahara nama kannadadalli en helthivi nama sarvagne en helidane undu shatapatha nadadu undu enada makkalalle malagidare vaidyana pandata villa sarvagne anta so millets also we have worked on millets little millets and fox millets akkiyanu unuvano akkiyan thagavano jolavano unuvano tholadan thagavano navaneyanu unuvano thavaneyante sarvagneya antantandu the 600 years back the food pattern the lifestyle model this one has been explained by our own but right now the western population is bringing this you know preventive programs of uh, framingham study but diabetes is a primary prevention study, all that. So this is in a lighter mode, I told about it. Yeah. And thank you very much, Mara, uh, Dr. Malikarjan. That's good. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Uh, Actually, we keep Dr. Professor Kotur's question in the end because the, they are really dicey questions. No, Sometimes the speaker has yeah. to ask, did I answer this question or not? And that is why we <laughs> take up his questions as the end. That's uh, in the last Somehow his note. mic and is not audible is... properly. No, no, sir, it is all. Okay. And the other uh, For me. thing which... Uh... For him. Okay. The other thing which is uh, what I wanted to tell you, the observation is, sir, I switched over from running into cycling now. So we have eco-friendly yeah. bicycles in the campus. And he is uh, <laughs> no, in the campus, yes, yes, yes. That is a good habit. You know, wherever he goes, <laughs> he brings some innovative ideas. Okay. Oh, hope that thank you. visit your Pondicherry you should not give me a cycle. <laughs> okay. Uh, with, on that lighter note, we'll uh, thank Dr. Malikarjun uh, Jali for a very, very entertaining and informative lecture. And uh, thank you very much. Even though we could not understand much of the poetry you said uh, at the end, I think Dr. Butt understood. Yeah, he will uh, translate. Will translate. <laughs> uh, will translate. <laughs> but we could understand that you are talking about lifestyle and uh, millets and things like that. Yeah. So that uh, even uh, that even very... your, uh, your uh, other poet, Tirvanalvar, a poet, uh -huh. is they are all contemporary, like uh, same similar uh, poets. Okay. Yeah. So it was a very interesting and entertaining, and also the question answer session we really liked very much because it gave us a glimpse of what you have been thinking about. So I would like to thank you on behalf of the Scientific Society of AVMC and also VMRF institution in general for accepting our invitation and delivering this talk. Uh, for the benefit of participants, we'll be moving on to another interesting episode next week and we will be talking about ethical problems in COVID management. And uh, we have none other than Dr. Nali Nandini Kumar, who is the former director general of ICMR yeah. and whom we know like uh, through our extensive yeah. workshops for good clinical practice and good laboratory practice and all. So she will be the one who will be addressing us and talking to us about the ethical issues which are going to be, which are involved in COVID care. So that is the topic for uh, next week. Uh, till then, uh, we'll again meet you next Friday. 
same time, three o'clock to four o'clock with another interesting episode. Till then, this uh, stay safe. Uh, wash hands, maintain social yeah. distancing. Even though COVID curve is coming down, but still it has not gone. So we'll continue to wear mask in public and whoever is not vaccinated will continue to take vaccine. So with those notes, we'll uh, finish today's uh, session. Thank you very much for participating yeah. in this. Thank you. Sir. Thank, Thank you, you everybody. Thank you, Professor uh, you, Sotur, especially for you and uh, Professor uh, Mahalakshmi. VN for uh, joining for this, uh, inviting me for this uh, lecture. I thank uh, all the other uh, senior faculty members. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye, sir. Thank you.